Hey, what's up, Reefers? Uh, welcome to the year 2021. First thing I need to say is Happy New Year! <laughs> For the year 2020, all I have to say is good riddance. Don't let the door hit your butt on the way out. 2020 has been a really challenging year for different reasons for different people. If we are watching the YouTube video here right now at this moment, we should consider ourselves lucky. There are a lot of people out there that does not have this privilege, so we should feel blessed. Going into 2021, I wish you and your family the best of luck in love, life, business, career, your reef tank, especially since this channel is a reefing channel. Regardless of how 2021 turns out to be, it's going to be better than 2020 and we're going to tackle it together. I hope you guys have a fantastic new year. And uh, let's jump into this video. Hello darkness, my old friend. I've come to seek your help again. Today we are doing three days blackout. I don't know what the heck I'm singing. So in the past, I've been pretty resistant to covering the tank for uh, amphidelium dinoflagellates because I've read that uh, blackout may not be that effective and it serves as a band-aid, which I think is true. And Daniel mentioned that it is true as well. But after discussing with him, the concept of a blackout is kind of like knock the dino back a pack or two first to give the bacteria and other algae a chance to really compete for the real estate because right now the dino is just covering everything. So again, in my particular case, the blackout may not necessarily just kill the dino outright. In fact, I do not expect it to. I'll be really, really surprised if it does, but as to knock it back a little bit, the silica dosing to induce diatom bloom as well as the other stuff seems to be working slowly, but I do see the dino coming in. It's covering all the rock and stuff like that. Coming out of three day blackout, based on my experience, I expect the sand to be spotless uh, for at least half a day or a day, but uh, likely the dino is going to return afterwards. Again, this serves as a band-aid but i'm hoping that by applying this band-aid it can stop the bleeding so the things can get a chance to really heal up and catch up uh, but we'll see how it goes on the side panel i have this big cardboard laying around it was actually from a tv that we got and we was going to use it for some like arts and crafts but hey we're jacking it um, so as you can see the tarp comes all the way up to here i have a little port here can I take a quick look i probably shouldn't be doing this as the blackout is commencing but just in case i can like pull it open we got a little panel right here I pull the skimmer cup but keep the skimmer itself running for aeration and to keep the ph up in terms of the little media reactor running gfo since my phosphate is at 0.17 today so i'm gonna leave the gfo running and i'll, I'll do a test tomorrow again to see where the system is at but i'm gonna pull this close this off and we're good to go oh man look at this little hyping gobies right there just like seeing what's going on all right well i'll see you guys in three days one eternity later all right what's up reefers today is a very very special day today is december 26th also known as the boxing day emily swears that boxing day is an international holiday but personally i've never heard of it I'll take her work for it. From what Emily tells me, Boxing Day is the day when people actually opens up the Christmas present. But in my family, we tend to open up present on the 25th Christmas day. But it just so happened that on Boxing Day is also the day I am ready to unwrap the 135 gallon tank after five full days of blackout. During this period of time, I did not peek at the tank at all. Auto feeder is inside the tarp, so I assume that it has been feeding. I've cut speed, uh, feeding way down. From what I've read, fish do not eat during blackouts, but there's also people that tell me that fish do eat during blackout. So just to be safe, I do a maintenance feeding of one time a day. All right, with my hair in place, let's finally take this apart. I'm a little bit nervous. I've heard some horror story from Blackout. Personally, I've done three days and five days, no problem at all. But at the same time, I've never kept Entheus and I climbed this size. So uh, let's take a look. <clears throat> oh, this is good to see. We got some life here. That's an Amphius. I really, really am happy to see this. I see two Amphius. Those are our biggest worry. The second worry is my clam. I was hoping the clam would be okay and it looks like it is okay. Uh, that frog spawn does not look good at all. That frog spawn looks like a goner. The big SPS in the back looks okay. I'm kind of nervous about the frags. This Euphelia, I was a little worried about as well, but it looks healthy. I think you just need some lights. Clamfish is here, perfect. Where's the... I'm checking the pump, make sure there's no fish stuck to the pump. That's my biggest fear as well. Uh, looks okay. Where's my hippo tank? Where is Dory? Usually he sleeps right there, but I don't. I do not see him. Space invader patinia. I see some skin poking out at the top. That's not good, but just a tiny bit. So we should be able to 
heal that back, assuming the tank parameters is uh, back to normal. I'm checking this embed, totally white as expected, bone white. But the real test comes, I think it's like three or four days later. And that's why I'm not pushing this video out this weekend. Uh, this is the weekend of 26 because I want to wait at least uh, a week to see if it comes uh, if the dino flagellates come back. Here's foulfish, and here's the ammo crab. Perfect time for me to catch crab, but I kind of need them because I start seeing one or two bubble algae coming back in. Okay. Oh wow! Okay, there's the bubble tip. <laughs> he is really reaching for the lights. He is struggling to find lights. That's why it's all the way up here. Unfortunately, this uh, is doing this on top of a aster snail. Sucks for the snails, but we'll, we'll solve this. Look at all these little starfish. I'm gonna use this opportunity to just pluck them all out because uh, they're starting to turn into a uh, infestation and the firefish won't swim all the way back. It's always interesting after like a long blackout to see like where things sit. We got the fish start waking up. Amphia started swimming away. All right, the only other thing that I really wanna see right now is my hippo tang. Where's my hippo tang? Look at all the water that's collected among the grids. Um, I've heard of this problem after I posted my video of using this uh, mesh top that uh, I'm gonna get salt creep here. But I figure it'd be okay if I just kind of like flake it once in a while or just, I actually have a spray bottle here. I can just spray it down or use a brush to brush it over to push the water through the finer grits. And the reason the water do this is because the grit is so fine that water can form like a layer in between the grits. I don't really have an issue uh, up until this point Probably because I'm not doing like micro bubble scrubbing that p kicks up a lot of water and stuff like that. Um, so it has not been an issue for me, but I can see how this could be an issue if you have a lot of surface agitation where you kick the water up, where it'll land among the grid. But for now, I'm just gonna use a brush and brush it down and prob probably like spray it down in the, in the shower and we should be okay. All right, well, I guess we're gonna give the tank a day or two um, for the light to ramp back up and we'll see if the, uh, Dinofagulates, cut the shops back up. But more importantly for me personally, I want to make sure the hippo tank is okay. But he has not shown his face, so I'm kind of concerned. Yeah, I also want to point out how dirty uh, everything has gotten uh, once I've took out the uh, skimmer cup. Look at all these things that got spilled out but was not skimmed out. These guys right here, especially on the joints and stuff like that, all the splashes of those like excess protein. Uh, to some extent, I think like in, in here and also a little bit on the carpet, terrible. I should probably have lowered the water level of the skimmer a little bit. Uh, it was kind of sitting right in the edge, so I did, we got some splashes right there. So I got to clean those up and here's emerald crab saying hi to me. Oh, look, there are the hyphen gobies. So that's two accounted for. I got two more somewhere in this tank, hopefully. I have still not seen the hippo tank. Oop. There it is, we found him. Uh, little hippo tank still napping right there, still not facing reality. Is it going to come back to life? Yeah. Looks like all the fish I counted, well, I, most of the fish I counted for, I'm still missing one amphibious, I think. I know a lot of people, they keep a reef tank and they care a lot more on corals than fish. Fish don't care. Fish is there just for like uh, utility reasons or for nitrate. For me, uh, fish. Fish trumps corals. Fish trumps most corals. There's certain corals I hold dear to my heart, but fish overall, I I, I care a lot more about. I, I care more about fish than corals that I have. So every time I happen to lose a fish, that guts me versus uh, losing corals. Um, I don't know why. It's just different people have different like priority. But for me, I feel like fish fish are legit pets. Holy smokes! Nitrate is through the roof. 50, 50. I'll say 55. Man, nitrate shot up. Well. Now that Christmas is over, I guess it's time to take down all the Christmas decoration or stars. Could not get all of them. There's still some on the rock work and whatnot. And I feel like there's a lot that I did not see. So what I think I may do is actually maybe uh, buy or borrow a Holocron shrimp. Let them clear out this tank and then I'll rehome the Holocron shrimp. It has worked really well in the past. Basically the shrimp cleans out the entire tank within two weeks. And then I uh, gave the last one over to uh, DC Reefer's school tank. So that worked out. So I may do something similar. Nuts! Phosphate sitting at 0.37, that is way high. I'm aiming for 0.1, and in the past five days or so, it, it crept up. It shot from 0.15-ish all the way to 0.37. That's more than double. Two days later. Today is the second day after blackout. Uh, because the nitrate is really high, I talked to Daniel from New York, and he recommended maybe doing a 30% water change, because a high nitrate is probably not that healthy for the fish. Overnight, I pre-mix about, I would say like 30 gallon of uh, freshly made salt water. 
Uh, this time I'm transitioning over to HW salts. I've been using the Trepid Marin Pro salt. It's a good salt, solid salt. One of the most popular salt for a good reason, but I want to make sure the DKA just matches what I'm trying to aim for, which is 8.5 to 9. And the HW salt, the alkalinity level is actually where I want it to sit. It came recommended from Telegram, a Reef Sensei, so gotta be good salt. Before we do anything, coffee. All right, my dear reefers, this is the second night after the blackout. Um, unfortunately, it seems like the dyno is back. It's uh, a lot lighter, but then again, this is only the second night. I do see some cyanobacteria coming in. I feel like the cyano is coming in pretty strong. In terms of dyno, that seems like dinos. That seems like dinos and that seems like dinos. But these are really light at the moment. I think just starting to come in. Uh, I've kept up with bacteria dosing with Microbac 7. Um, <laughs> Crossing my fingers. I feel like the blackout kind of reset everything. So everything kind of start from square one again to see whichever is fastest in terms of uh, getting a foothold on the real estate. So hopefully uh, cyanobacteria, diatom and stuff like that will have a uh, faster and stronger hold this time versus dinoflagellates. Uh, last round, dinoflagellate has a head start because the nitrate phosphate level was really low, especially nitrate. That's why I was able to grab all this real estate before uh, other algae comes in. But the purpose of the blackout is to kind of like push the dino back a little bit. So everything kind of start from like square one and see whoever's fastest. Uh, if everything being equal, I think diatom cyanobacteria should have a legs up. We'll see how it goes. And one really annoying thing is that the um, neon goby, he really likes chilling the clam and really seems to be bothering the clam. Look at that. And this has been happening since the, even before the blackout, the neon goby just seems to really like chilling in the in the clam. I don't know what's going on. I'm gonna look this up to see if this is something of concern and if this is something that the clam could get used to. It would be really cool to see a neon goby just kind of like resting on the clam but at the same time if it bothers the clam then the neon goby needs to be addressed. Well look at the fish. The fish is all healed up. You guys remember the hippo tank from two videos ago? It was all beaten up. Uh, looks like it's completely healed. The torn fins of the clownfish completely healed. Uh, Larry Tell male seems to have kind of calmed down a little bit, no longer challenging all the other fish. So that's fantastic to see. All right, well, now it's kind of like a waiting game to see which algae comes in and kind of take over the tank. Hopefully it's not the dinoflagellate, even though it's not technically an algae. The next morning. Are you guys tired of this view yet? I am tired of uh, doing water tests. We need the Mastertronic. But here's the third day. We're doing a morning uh, water test on nitrates. This is the day after the water change. It looks like the nitrate got diluted a little bit. Um, we're probably sitting at, I'll say 30 ppm nitrates. Phosphate did not really budge, it's still sitting at 0.35. Um, so I think what I'm gonna do is gonna add more to the GFO media. I do have a small media reactor running for GFO. Uh, so I'm gonna jam more in there and hopefully that'll bring the level down a little bit and we'll check again in day or two. Hey, what's up, Reefers? It has been about four days post blackout, and things has been rough for this tank. I'm definitely seeing tissue loss on the LPS corals. I feel like that could be attributed to the raised nitrate, the raised phosphate, and just the general swings in the nutrients. Alkalinity has been stable at 8.8, .8 and pH has been solid above 8, which is surprising because I usually have low pH, so high pH is always welcome. So during the blackout period, the nitrate shot up from 20 to about 50 ppm, phosphate shot up from 0.15 to 0.3 uh, post blackout. During the blackout period, I only did one one test, I probably should have done more. I did one test at the second day of blackout, so I was like, okay, things look the same, so probably not much change. I'm guessing a lot of die off happened on the third or fourth and fifth days of blackouts uh, where the nitrate and phosphate just crept up, did not catch it. If I've caught it, most likely I'll just end the blackout at that point and just let the tank kind of absorb the, uh, the nutrient again. But for whatever reason, either it's a die off or the LG dying, so nothing is really using the nitrate and phosphate these levels shut up. As a result, I believe that the tank went through another swing, which stressed a lot of the corals. That was my fault for not doing water tests every single day of the blackout. Don't be like the inappropriate reefer, where you see the second day, the test is exactly the same, and you're just kind of like, all right, well, it was nice to have a break from water tests after doing it for three weeks straight, um, and kind of skip the next three days and turn around and bite me in the butt. Ever since the blackout, I'm just kind of like keep up with maintenance, um, let things slowly get back to normal. I did perform one water change because the nitrate is really high. Uh, the kicker is for New Year, my family is actually going away for five days and four nights, which is not ideal. So I'm gonna use this opportunity to just kind of let the tank settle in and I'm not gonna touch it all the time and just let it do its own thing. It has everything it needs. It has raised level of nitrate, it has a raised level of phosphate. I have been pumping it with Mycobacter 7. I'm doing one last frozen food feeding before I leave. Uh, this is gonna be for the fish, for the corals, but mainly for the NPS 
corals. Um, and then we got a little webcam set up pointing to the tank so I can kind of monitor and see what's happening. What a shitty way to end 2020. It also seems appropriate at the same time. 2020 has been like a really shitty year. There's no better way to put it. Um, hopefully 2021 will be better. And I guess when you're watching this, it'll be 2021. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Week later. We got some buffaloes over there. We got a caboose over there. And we got a caboose over there. Really cool. I don't know what she's doing. <laughs> <laughs> Look at this! They totally remodel the inside of Caboose. Looks very nice. Uh, we just finished Christmas. That's why we got this really Christmas themed, which is awesome. They somehow were able to fit a uh, mini Christmas tree down here. So, so that's amazing. All right, we go here. Ooh. We got a master bedroom here, right here. Actually, quite roomy for a train, dude. This is nice. This bathroom was surprisingly roomy as well. It's actually larger than some of the hotels that we stayed at. Look at this. But I think the highlight is definitely that little section right here. The loft, I'll call it. You climb up, try not to fall. I'm struggling a little bit. Climb up. Oh my God. You climb up. And you get a little loft area up here. That is cool. Look, she's shaking the whole train. That's a wake up call right there. If there's any, been any. Look at this. You get like a nice 360 view. And these uh, these window are one way one way window film. So people can see from outside in, but you can see from inside out, which is kind of cool. This has been a really interesting stay. Three days later. Before I dive deeper into dinoflagella, as you can see this through here, there are certain things I need to tweak. I want to tweak certain corals placement, namely this frog spawn. I feel like always in the front of the frog spawn, regardless of whether it's this or the uh, octo spawn a little bit earlier, they always get ripped off. It looks like the tissue is peeling off the uh, skeleton. We've tried tweaking the lighting, that's not it. Um, obviously there was some nutrient issue, but I feel like for the most part, they have been soft. Remaining frog spawn seems happy except for the part that is uh, directly in the path of the flow. So my thinking is to move this to back there where the flow is really calm. As you can see, there's barely any flow right there. And I'm gonna move the clam out front. Uh, this serves two purposes. Number one, of, of course, for the frog spawn. And number two, that neon goby, you see the blue one right there? He has somehow taken up residence inside the uh, there is a clam. And I say inside, I mean inside. He, well, not inside, inside the clam. But nowadays, he likes to just lay on the mantle of the clam. As you can see, it's uh, really irritating the clam. Trying to convince the Neogobi to move somewhere else, I'm gonna swap places. This is gonna go here, that is gonna go here, and I'm also gonna move these frog spawns, or these hammers, back there for a lower flow because I feel like flow-wise, uh, even up top right there, it's a little bit too strong. You can see how the polyp has been blown uh, pretty viciously by the flow. Trying way too hard to make sure that I was doing exactly what my followers wanted to see, exactly what my subscribers did, wanted to see. I was hey, look at this, this is kind of cool, look at that. You guys see, see the pistol shrimp right here? Uh, it's funny because this little pistol shrimp uh, he roams around different burrows. So I have one single hyphen goby that lives right here. I got the pair of hyphen gobies that lives in this cluster right here. And then I got one single hyphen goby that lives around here as well. And I, I've seen the pistol shrimp show up here and here. So I feel like underneath the sand bed, the pistol shrimp just constructed some like massive layers and the different hyphen goby just take different entrance. It's, uh, it's interesting. I'm really curious like how things are working out there. But for now, as long as everybody's happy, like uh, once in a while I'll see hyphen goby kind of chase each other around a little bit. Um, no big, no big deal. Um, but yeah. Oh, there's the other one. Look at that. Four to six more days later. All right, guys. This week's focus is to get the water back. Whoa, that can't be right. Phosphate down to 0.13. It's only been like two days. Uh, I'm gonna run another phosphate test. That's really weird. And here's the retest. We're sitting at 0.15. So while doing the test, I actually checked the record. I remember wrong. There has been a slowly decrease on the phosphate and I remember wrong. Once again, um, this shows the importance of keeping track of the parameters, not just in your mind because like you see, I remember wrong. I'm guessing that by tomorrow or the day after, we should be able to hit the uh, point 0.1 target. So yeah, finally within range. I think like once we get to point 0.1, I may try to drive it down even further to point 0.05. That would be nice. But uh, I'm happy. The next thing to target will be nitrate. But I think that should come down uh, pretty quickly once the phosphate is down. I guess the GFO in the little media reactor is slowly but surely working it down. All right, Reefer, so it has been about three weeks since the blackout and about four to five days since the last water change. I just want to give you a quick 
tank update. During the blackout, the nutrient really spiked and that really did a number on quite a few of the corals, namely the SPS. I feel like the SPS really, really suffered. Uh, the frog spawn, like the one back there, also suffered. And I definitely lost at least three or four SPS frag. Another coral that I'm really gutted for losing is actually Bahama Lama Scully. Uh, it's a tiny little rainbow Scully. It looks absolutely gorgeous. Unfortunately, I lost it. I'm really sorry, Remy. Um, uh, I should have moved that to the mangrove tank, but I didn't realize my mangrove tank, it's uh, pretty stable compared to this tank. I thought this tank is in decent shape. It wasn't, and I thought my mangrove tank was in worse shape. It wasn't. Case in point, the Candy King Kryptonite, uh, the one in the 135, totally just kind of peeled off. But the good news is that the larger chunk that I actually moved to the mangrove tank as a test fantastically it's all puffed up recovering right now so i should have moved more corals there with that said though there are some silver linings for example the space invader was looking kind of sad maybe like two weeks ago the skeleton is starting to show at the edge and it got a little bit worse as the week went on but as you can see now it's really recovering just that little tip shows skeleton now everything else has recovered so it's, it's fantastic to see the rose bubbles of anatomy actually pick a really nice spot to settle in i hope that it will continue to stay there and I actually saw the female clownfish slept in the rose bubble of anatomy so that is definitely a silver lining now you may notice uh oh what happened to all the euphilias well the euphilias were looking really really sad but i think it's uh, due to a combination of things number one the raised nutrient they did not like that number two the water flow i did not realize how much i hated water flow until i moved them to the back of the tank at the moment there's hardly any flow back there it's been there for like about three days and it has not puffed up like that in quite a while. I got the idea to move the colonies when I saw that this head that was uh, sitting where the clam is right now started peeling away. Nothing is chewing on it. There's no decay matter and stuff like that. It's just the skin is simply slowly peeling away. So I figured maybe the flow is just blasting it a little bit too hard. So I decided to move it to the portion of the tank that does not get a strong a direct flow. I didn't think the flow was strong over there, but apparently it was. But I really moved these guys mainly for this chunk because this chunk, as you looked a little bit earlier in this video, they're all shrunken up and kind of pissed off. But as you can see here, they've just been in this spot for about three days and is totally puffed up. Now this could be due to, like I mentioned, a couple of things. Number one, I moved it to a lower flow area. Mm -hmm. And number two, the phosphate is now much more under control. Same thing with the Zoas. I understand that Zoa has a pretty direct connection with uh, high phosphate. If they're closed up, usually that means the phosphate is high. Luckily, we did not really experience a lot of Zoas closing up this round, even with the high phosphate. But I do notice that some of the Zoas really stretching up because I dial back the lights. I think it's getting a little bit wonky, so I dial back the light to about 50% and then slowly ramp it up again. And I think things are really starting to come back around due to the lower nutrient level and gradually raising a light again. So the big question is, did the blackout actually work? And would that be something that I would do again? So if we're just looking at the sand bed right now, you see that yes, the dinoflagellate is back as I mentioned that it would. But one thing I did notice is that I don't have as much of a coverage as before. Maybe given some more time, maybe in a week or two, I may have more coverage. But at the same time, I feel like Dino is coming back a lot slower this time around, especially on the rock work. I see some over here, but it was covered. And I feel like in terms of proportion, this time around, I definitely see a lot more green algae and cyanobacteria in comparison to Dino flagellates. Because if you look at my uh, last video where I talked about Dino flagellant, it's mostly Dino and just a little bit of Cyano, a little bit of green hair algae on the glass and that's pretty much it. Most of them is di Dino flagellates. So I do think the blackout serves its purpose in terms of like resetting everything and give everything the equal same chance to start. And I feel like this time around, Dino does not have a head start. So hopefully this will kind of give the uh, other algae and bacteria a boost to uh, colonize all the real estate. Now doing all these exercises and diving a little bit deeper with Daniel, I do believe the proper steps should have been blackout first if blackout is part of the program to knock the dino back reset everything and then uh the silica if that's uh the way that i'm planning to go and also raising nitrate raising phosphate and of course in terms of blackout i should have monitored the uh, the water parameters so that if i see a spike in nitrate and phosphate to like such a high level i would just end the blackout and just do water change that said though i do believe for certain types of dinoflagellants the blackout will force them into the water column and that's where the uv is going to come in and just kind of kill them all but unfortunately for the amphidelium types of dinoflagellant that i have from what i understand that they go go under the sand versus going 
into this uh, water column. So blackout is not that effective in terms of eliminating them. But a blackout in terms of amphidiniums does serve as a little tool, not a big one, to kind of knock them back a pack of two in order to give the algae and bacteria a chance to fight for the real estate. As a footnote, there was a thread that I came across that was posted by a marine biologist studying amphidinium dinoflagellans. They mentioned that the blackout is effective at the nine days, nine days and up, that it is effective against the amphidinium. I do not have the heart to black the tank out for nine days, so that path is not for me. But if you have a tank that does not have a lot of corals or a tank that does not have a lot of fish, and you have nothing to lose, maybe a nine day blackout is the answer for amphidinium dinoflagellans. And of course, if you have the other type of dinoflagellant where it goes into the water column after a blackout, and by all means, blackout should be super effective for you. Fighting dinoflagellant is gonna be a long-term battle. Uh, the last time I fought it in the 45 gallon tanks, I think it took me about a month before I really got rid of it. It was a combination of blackouts and hydrogen peroxide dosing. It took a while, but it definitely worked. I believe that also raising nitrate and phosphate last round also helped as well. The moment while the blackout is not as super effective as I hoped it would have been, I knew this was coming, but at the bottom of my heart, I kind of wish that, okay, maybe after blackout, it's just gonna be gone. That was not the case. But I do notice from looking at the tank all these time that the dinoflagellant this time around is not as aggressive as the last time I had it, uh, regardless of the reason. So I am hopeful, but this is an ongoing battle and I'm purposely not scraping the front glass because I do want these algae to kind of compete with the dinoflagellants. And of course we got the Chato going in the uh, refugium section of the tank as well. So just like a lot of story and videos in this channel, this is an ongoing development. I'll keep you guys posted on my fight against the amphidinium dinoflagellant. I hope you guys had a fantastic beginning of 2021 and I apologize once again for missing last week's video. I've just been traveling. I was not able to sit down and edit and cut a video together. In place of the video, I actually did a live stream and a lot of you guys actually jumped on. I kind of enjoy that format a lot as well. So I think from this point forward, I'll keep up with the Sunday videos and once in a while, I'll hop on the live stream probably at some weird hours just so that I don't really bump heads with other live streamers and then we'll just chat. It'll be great to catch up. With that said, so hope you guys have a good week and I'll see you guys next Sunday at 12.30 p.m. shot. I, I don't know what's going on, but uh, it's a pretty awesome start of 2021. Yeah.